Mexico. We're currently in a restaurant carved out of an enormous cave on the edge of Teotihuacan, an ancient Mesoamerican site first uncovered in 1905 that spans 32 square miles. There are two vast pyramids here, the Pyramid of the Moon, and the Pyramid of the Sun, and a huge temple, one of 18, in fact, amazingly, only 20 per center of the site has been uncovered. Carbon dating suggests that the city goes back as far as 400 BC, and was once home to 200,000 people. Although they worshipped the elements, and accorded great status to the serpent and the jaguar, there's a stunning geometry to the structures here which bespeaks of an intelligence rather higher than the one that was occupying the British Isles at the time, stone circles were the best we could manage. It also gives the place some seriously spooky natural acoustics. Clap your hands, my guy Tonadia, aka Gorilla, says. The sound reverberates off all four corners with crystal clarity. Later, we'll sit in a cave and burn some seeds from the Copaleo tree to give thanks to the gods. Gorilla has done this with Bono, Sting, David Bowie, and Brian Adams, they could have held Live Aid down here. The point is, this is one of the coolest places on earth. Fast forward 24 hours and we're at the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez, recently restored home of the Mexican Grand Prix, sitting in the perhaps unexpectedly well-engineered cockpit of the bowl. What a place this is. The track is an engine punishing 2,240m above sea level, 7,340 feet, for a start, and weaves its way for 4.3 kilometers through a park that will feel familiar to anyone who's been to Monza, although the surrounding area is rather less grand than Milan's Royal Park. The circuit itself makes up in history what it lacks in glamour compared to its European compadres. Younger motor racing fans might not be so familiar with Ricardo and Pedro Rodriguez, the Mexican brothers who arrived like comets into the sport in the early 1960s, and whom the track's name rightly honors. F1 is a kindergarten these days, but when Ricardo Rodriguez raced for Ferrari in 1961, he was just 19. Unheard of, back then. A circuit was duly created in the Magdalena Mihuka Park in 1962, but before Ricardo could race in F1 proper there, he was killed during practice at the will of Rob Walker's Lotus 24, in one of the non-championship races that were common at the time. Fast but notoriously fragile, the Lotus's rear suspension had collapsed. He was only 20. His brother Pedro continued racing, and made his second appearance in F1 in the 1963 Mexican GP, also in a Lotus. He'd already raced a Ferrari 500 TR at LE Mans, as early as 1958 when he was just 18, and would race there 14 times in all most successfully co-driving a Ford GT40 to victory in 1968 with Lucien Bianchi. One of the greatest ever sports car racers, Rodriguez was closely associated with two of the era's most iconic names, Luigi Kainetti's NART Ferrari squad, for whom he raced the 250 GTO, amongst other famous Ferraris, and John Wire's Gulf-sponsored Porsche team, with whom he won the 24 Hours of Daytona, and endurance races at Monza and Spa. The 250 GTO and 917, Jamagit. Rodriguez also had supernatural wet weather skills, and his performance in the BOAC 1000 km of Brands Hatch is still regarded by many as one of the greatest drives of all. Pedro drove 197 of the race's 235 laps, and his win, by a 5 lap margin after 7 hours, prompted rival driver Chris Amon to say, why doesn't someone tell Pedro it's raining? The great man was killed during a race in Germany in July 1971. Those boys weren't around long, but they sure left their mark. They're setting up for a Roger Waters gig while we're here, so a full lap of the track isn't on the cards. But even just using the stadium section, it's obvious the ball is no opportunistic Pedro in a shed lash up from the get-go. Actually, having met Iker and Guillermo Echeverria during the Goodwood FOS a few years ago I knew this already. Their background is in industrial design, similar to BAC Spriggs Brothers, and there's an intelligence to the Vols concept and execution that really is a cut above. Plus, 
they're funny and engaging guys. Turns out that their father was a successful GT racer in the 1970s, and won a few championships in a Lotus Europa. Like the British Mono, the Mexican 05 is a sensational looking thing whose swoops and ducks keep yielding thrilling visual information the more you examine it. The configuration isn't new, a 2.0 liter Ford EcoBoost engine making 285 bhp sits in the middle of a bonded and riveted aluminium tub, harnessed to a 6 speed manual box, also from Ford. The outer panels are fiberglass, but you can have them in carbon fiber. The suspension uses double wishbones at both ends, and the dampers are fully adjustable. Although they're based in a hangar alongside Airbus and Bombardier in Mexico's Querétaro airport, the car is actually something of an international effort. It was designed in Italy, Magna co-developed the chassis, Lotus worked on the suspension, Canadian specialist Multimatic is involved, and Michelin worked with them on the tires. So there is pedigree here. We build up the cars in bays that look just like the ones in F1, Iker tells me. Being in the aerospace environment is pushing us further, but that's what we want, where we need to be. The Vol 05, Iker concedes, is a deliberately more compliant proposition. Mexico's poorly surfaced roads, they're almost as bad as the UK's, means that the car has an unusually generous 110 mm of ground clearance. But at just shy of 700 kg all up, the 400 bhp per ton power to weight ratio is enough to be getting on with, especially as we prepare to tackle the notorious traffic of Mexico City. The Volar has 600 bhp per ton, a SODEV sequential box, and a more track-oriented chassis setup. One for another day. TG has already tested the Vol on a track, so we know it delivers, definitely in terms of performance, 0 to 62 miles per hour in 3.7 seconds, traction, and overall balance, if not as the ultimate, telepathic track day weapon. If you want a lightweight car for darting through cities, this is the one to have, to quote TG's in-house hand Ollie Marriage. Today, this is good news, and a certain amount of darting is achieved. But the city's reputation as the NE plus ultra of traffic adult megalopolises is well founded. Approximately 22 million people live in Greater Mexico City, and there are 3.5 million cars on the move during peak periods. Well, sort of on the move. Coming into land at the airport, you spend longer passing over the urban sprawl than even final approach into Los Angeles serves up. It goes on forever, an undulating patchwork of concrete and high rises, enlivened by clumps of brightly colored shanty towns. At ground level, this metastasizes into such an afflicted, dysfunctional traffic flow it makes London look like a walk in the park. In these circumstances, the Vol's lightweight clutch and controls, not to mention its awesome visibility, are all greatly appreciated. It also means conversation is freely had. Is that a Ferrari? Someone asks. Flattering. A busload of school kids goes crazy. A street vendor tries to sell me something called chic herons, a corn snack ladled in hot sauce. Not with my driving gloves on, sir. The main roads, Avenue Insurgents, which runs all the way to Acapulco, or Reforma, which ends in the pretty Chapultec Park area, are stuffed. Driving here is a combat sport akin to the Mexican wrestling that everyone loves. But soon I realize that many of the side streets are much less frantic, and the neighborhoods are truly fascinating. Nationally, Mexico's upper and middle classes are small, but the bars and retail in the Polanco area, including many high-end car brands, suggests the people with money in the capital know what to do with it. But we spend more time in the Roma Norte area, whose slightly grittier, hipster atmosphere somehow calls to mind Barcelona, Berlin, and Shoreditch all at the same time without being exactly like any of them, or as tryhard. The architecture is an artfully faded mix of old colonial art deco, art nouveau and modernist, and there are shops and cafes everywhere you look. And trees, suddenly, the sprawling, suffocating traffic is a world away. The roads are even wide enough to squirt the vol between traffic lights, 
and it shrugs off the rattled road surface with no problem at all. Speed bumps need care, though. It's also a great place for fans of lesser spotted cars, my iPhone quickly fills up with images of battered vehicles, American, Japanese, and European, that look like they might have been in Breaking Bad. The sun gives them an irresistible patina, even if it's cooked the molding on their dashboards to the point of no return. This weekend, the Brothers Vol will be in Miami as their cars take part in the annual race of champions, they've just signed a five-year deal with Rock. Let's hope it brings them, their awesome little 05, and their country the recognition they deserve.